Welcome everyone to our historical tour of St. Leo's Catholic Church, which was renovated in its completion in 2020. Our opening mass was December 19th, 2020 with Bishop David Kagan, Bishop Austin Vetter, former pastor of St. Leo's, and 39 priests of the Diocese of Bismarck. It is my intention as the pastor of St. Leo's to give you a historical analysis of how this all took place. In 2008, uh, after my ordination in July, both Father Vetter and myself, now who is Bishop Vetter of the Diocese of Helena, arrived in Minot to St. Leo the Great Parish. I was the chaplain of Bishop Ryan, an associate of St. Leo's, and he was the pastor. Within the first year of us being here, there were many different challenges that we faced. One, maybe first and foremost, was the structure of St. Leo's. Built in 1908, it had been many, many, many years since any type of updates to the structure itself had been done. After evaluation of the structure, Father Vetter discovered that the tuck pointing on the outside of the church was completely in need of repair. The roof was roughly 100 years old, and many, many other things to the exterior were damaged. In particular, the north tower of St. Leo's was so rotted out from water damage that it was estimated if a wind from 60 to maybe 90 miles an hour came through Minot, it would have blown the tower off the church into central campus. Needless to say, the situation was dire, but he was up for the challenge. Starting in 2010, preparations were made for a capital campaign which was executed between late 2010 and 2011. Construction began in 2011, and both a new roof, as well as all of the tuck pointing and all of the different structural damage that had been done to the exterior and the roof interior was changed at that time. The total cost roughly of that renovation was $3.5 million. Shortly after that renovation was completed, which was a complete success and very much supported by the parish. Not only that, it was during the flood that Minot experienced in 2011, and yet the parish rose to the occasion, not only repairing their homes and surviving the flood, but continuing their contributions to the capital campaign as we renovated the exterior of the church. It was commendable to say the least, and both Father Vetter and myself were extremely proud of our people during that time. In 2012, I became pastor after Bishop David Kagan became bishop. Father Vetter was sent to the North American College in Rome to be head of spirituality. Needless to say, we still had much debt left after Father Vetter had left. And so from 2012 to 2015, we focused on paying off that debt. It was also during that time, though, that we dug into the challenges that we had on the interior of St. Leo's. Our footings were inadequate, the cantilever was beginning to crumble, the electrical, the mechanical, and the plumbing had all decayed to a point that they all were in need of serious repair, if not complete replacement. We also discovered that we had a dirt floor in the basement versus a cement floor. After much analysis with architects, engineers, construction managers, and contractors, we came up with a general idea of, of a plan of what we needed to do to St. Leo's, at least structurally, mechanically, electrically, and so forth. It was also during that time that through many, many holy hours that had been instituted in the parish, that through prayer and contemplation, I began to envision what the interior art and theological construction of St. Leo's might be. From 2015 to 2016, I really began to get my mind around what I wanted to place theologically and artistically into the interior of St. Leo's. Working with Mr. Alan Warmka, an artist of the Upper Midwest who I had done two other projects with, namely Bishop Ryan Catholic School's chapel, as well as Bishop David Kagan's chapel with my brother in Bismarck, we began to have in-depth conversations as to what might be incorporated. I had received many of these different insights from the various pilgrimages that we had taken with the people of St. Leo's over to Rome and even over to France. As we began to think through this, the design slowly but surely came into fruition. And what was once in my mind and in my heart began to be put to paper. In 2016, meeting with artists, architects, and contractors, we came up with a full-scale plan that we brought to bid. 
The very interesting part about this is that we had bid this project in 2016, but we were unable to afford to do this project at that time. After that, we launched a capital campaign in 2016. Now, the very interesting part about the capital campaign is rather than hire a company to do it, I did it with a group in the parish through the rectory. So over the course of the year 2016, we had over a thousand people through St. Leo's Rectory. I smoked over six to 700 pounds of barbecue and we celebrated our way to $3.5 million raised. After having the success of raising $3.5 million, we then took the project to bid again in early 2017. To our surprise, construction had turned downward in Minot and the bids came back close to $1.5 million cheaper than what they were when we had initially admitted. This was very well received both by myself, my construction manager Dean Feist, and the rest of the parish. But it also allowed us to increase what we were going to do artistically to the inside of St. Leo's. Beginning in 2018 with much enthusiasm, we began the interior updates and construction updates to the structural, mechanical, and electrical components of St. Leo's Catholic Church. Headed by Rollerack Construction and under the supervision of Mr. Dean Feist, my construction manager, for the next year to year and a half, we undertook this tremendous challenge. It was a success. Working with some of the best people that Minot has to offer, we not only repaired, but updated all of a 110-year-old church to a modern interior church in the areas of its mechanical, electrical, and structural components. We are very proud to say the least. And in late 2018, we began the artistic renovation of St. Leo's. For the next year, working with Mr. Alan Warmka and Mr. Craig Gallagher, we undertook the tremendous challenge of updating the artistic components as well as the theological construct of St. Leo's Catholic Church. Over the course of this virtual tour, I will be explaining the major artistic updates as well as the theological components of what we put into St. Leo's Catholic Church. It is safe to say that everything in this particular artistic renovation first was to mimic and to hold as true as possible to the original church but secondly, we desired that every single component of this artistic renovation would say something theological to the people of St. Leo's, not only now, but for years into the future. Over the course of the next several sections of this video, I will be explaining the theological meaning of the artistic renovation of St. Leo's Catholic Church. To begin with, it is best to describe the facade of the entire sanctuary of St. Leo's. It is designed in several different layers, as I like to refer. First is the prosemian arch. Second is the interior arch of the prosemian arch. Third is the dome. Fourth is the back of the high altar. The fifth layer is the tabernacle. And then the centerpiece of the altar. Beginning with the prosemian arch, which is the exterior facade of the sanctuary of St. Leo's. The imagery of the art on the prosemian arch is from St. Paul's Outside the Walls in Rome. St. Paul's Outside the Walls in Rome is a replica of the original St. Peter's Basilica. That basilica burned and it was replaced by the present St. Peter's Basilica. The theology of the image itself is that Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, is seated on the rock. The rock stands for the church, and the four streams flowing from the rock are the four gospels in our scriptures. The four streams, then, are feeding the 12 sheep, six on each side, feeding off the water pouring from the rock. Those are symbolic of the 12 apostles who represent our modern bishops who bring the gospel to the priests, and subsequently the priests bring it to the people. You will notice on the left side of the prosemian arch is the town of Bethlehem, which begins our Lord's life. A very interesting part about this particular piece on the prosemian arch, and it was not intended in our renovations, but guided by the Holy Spirit, 
was that our Blessed Lady in the south window is looking at Bethlehem. That window was put in in the original church and we had no intention of that connection. It just worked out that way. If we go to the right side of the proscenium arch, you have the town of Jerusalem in which our Lord is crucified at the end of his ministry. Again, unbeknownst to us, on the north side, the window, Christ is looking towards Jerusalem, which also connects that window to that time in his life. Then on the base of the imagery, we have on the left side of the proscenium arch, a quote from Revelation above which is the Alpha with the cross put in because Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. On the left it reads, Behold, I am coming soon and I bring with me recompense I will give to each according to his deeds, which is what the Lord will bring at the end of time. On the right side is the Omega, in which underneath is the second part of the same paragraph from Revelation. Blessed are they who wash the robes so as to have the right to the tree of life and enter the city through its gates. One might ask, why would Father Waltz put that in such a bold and prominent place on the Persimian Arch? My answer to that is, anyone who knows me in 2020 knows that I firmly believe that we are much closer to the second coming of Christ than farther away. Not the end of the world, but what Revelation refers to as the era of peace. And so this is my way, not only for the people that I have ministered to at St. Leo's now, but for the generations to come, to prepare yourselves, washing your souls in the blood of the Lamb, practicing your faith and confessing your sins. For I believe that the second coming of Christ is very close. The second level underneath the Persimian arch is inscribed with the center of John's Gospel. A very interesting part about John's Gospel is he does not write in a linear fashion, but a circular fashion, meaning that the center of his Gospel is the most important teaching that he is going to teach you throughout all of his Gospel. A very unique part about his Gospel is that he has the washing of the feet rather than the institution of the Eucharist at the end of his Gospel because in the center of his Gospel is the discourse on the bread of life in which Jesus himself makes the bold and salvific statement, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life within you. The reason why we are at Sunday Mass or even at daily Mass is for one reason. It is not for the community. It is not for the music. It's not for Father's homily. But most especially, it is for the Lord himself that for our salvation we eat his flesh and drink his blood, which is eternal life. And so as a bold and prominent statement, one of the first things that you see when you walk into St. Leo's is engraved those very words from the center of the Gospel of John, reminding this generation and generations to come that the reason why you are at Mass is for the Eucharist and the Eucharist alone. The third level of the upper level of the sanctuary is the dome. Part of the vision of the dome was to incorporate our patron, St. Leo the Great. As I prayed about how to incorporate him, I was reminded of Pope John Paul II and living in a generation in which the people of the world, Catholic believers, upon his death already titled him St. John Paul the Great. It is a very interesting title because the title the Great does not come from Rome, does not come from the church, but it comes from the lay faithful in honor of great leadership corresponding to a Holy Father. Clearly, St. Peter, the Rock, our original and founding Pope, was obviously the great and the greatest. If we travel through time, the next Pope that received that title was St. Leo the Great. The third Pope was St. Gregory the Great. And we are blessed in our modern day and age to have St. Pope John Paul II, the Great. I had the privilege of meeting Pope John Paul II in 2004. It was one of the most moving experiences of my life. And it was my honor to put four, these four great Popes into the dome. A very unique part about the images of these Popes is that they are taken from the images 
of the popes at St. Paul's Outside the Walls in Rome. If you do research on this church or you visit it, you will discover that each pope from Peter all the way to Pope Francis presently has their own medallion running in succession from Peter to Pope Francis. We decided that we wanted to lift those medallions from St. Paul's outside the walls and place a one-to-one -one replica in the dome of St. Leo's. That way for future generations, should they take a pilgrimage to Rome and visit St. Paul's outside the walls, they will be blessed to be able to go and find these exact images in that blessed church. Two on each side in the center is an image of God the Father. God the Father himself is sending the Holy Spirit in the image of himself in the dome. God the Father is sending the Holy Spirit from heaven. And if you notice, right underneath the Holy Spirit is our Lord crucified. And so the theological concept is that God the Father sends the Holy Spirit through the crucified Son. And the crucified Son, now risen from the dead, is in the tabernacle. And so the fourth level is the crucifixion of Christ on the cross in the high altar. And the fifth level is the tabernacle itself, which houses the Lord himself in the Blessed Sacrament. Our high altar is very Romanesque, but it also has hints of the original high altar in St. Leo's that burned in the 1969 fire. The corpus on the cross is the original corpus that goes all the way back to the country church that was built in Minot in 1876. That and the statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary are two of the only remaining items that we have from that church that Bishop Vincent Worley, at the time, Father Worley, built. Monsignor Joseph Wraith then built the present church that we are in. Above the cross, you will see a beautiful, shiny gold medallion. Within that medallion is a relic of the true cross of Christ himself. In 1908, Monsignor Joseph Wraith somehow, by the grace of God, acquired a fairly substantial relic. It was so large, in fact, that in 2017, in one of my pilgrimages to Rome, I was able to take it to the Augustinian sisters and have them split the relic of the true cross of Christ into two. One is in the cross in the high altar, and the other is housed in the altar cross that the priest celebrates Mass to every Sunday. The fifth level of the sanctuary is our beautiful custom tabernacle made in Barcelona, Spain. The various theological elements on the tabernacle are as follows. The tabernacle is crowned with an image of the Blessed Virgin Mary holding the Christ child. Underneath the Blessed Virgin Mary, housed in the cupola, is Saint Michael the Archangel with his foot over the head of the devil who he has defeated. As we move down, we have the four gospel writers that flank the tabernacle on the four different corners. And in the center then, the image of the pelican. For those of you who may not be aware, the pelican is a symbol of Christ in the Eucharist. Because the pelican is the only bird that if her chicklets are starving, will tear open her own chest and feed them her chest muscle, even if it means her death. One of the central parts of the tabernacle is its door, which is another symbolic image of the Lamb. As John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, in reference to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as a symbol on the exterior of the door of the tabernacle is the risen Lamb, victorious in his resurrection but it is also a symbol of who resides inside of the tabernacle, namely the resurrected Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. The sixth level of the sanctuary, although small, is this beautiful rendition of the Last Supper. In the original high altar of St. Leo's that burned in the 1969 fire, the center of that high altar in the exact same place was a beautiful rendition of the Last Supper. That Last Supper was custom made in 1908 and put into the freshly made high altar of that time. We were blessed to be able to acquire a Last Supper hand-carved from Germany from 1908. 
I have to be honest, when we got it, it was in rough condition, but the carving was exquisite. And so our artists set to work, refurbishing the beautiful Last Supper, which is reminiscent of the original that was in the original high altar of St. Leo's. The seventh and final layer of the sanctuary is our beautiful new altar, topped with Carrara marble from Italy. It also houses this beautiful one-of-a-kind medallion in its center. Many say that the Sacred Heart of Jesus devotion was finally fulfilled in the revelation of the Divine Mercy to St. Sister Faustina. And so to that end, we took the image of the Sacred Heart, crowned in thorns, pierced with the lance, and combined it with elements of the Divine Mercy devotion. On the lower end, on the left side, you will see the two rays, red and white, coming forth from the heart of Jesus that are symbolic of the blood and water that flowed from his heart when it was pierced on the cross. And then around the medallion on the outside is St. Sister Faustina's beautiful prayer for the salvation of souls. O blood and water which gush forth from the heart of Jesus, as a fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. We feel that this beautiful medallion, both exemplifying the Sacred Heart as well as the Divine Mercy, also reminds the people of not what, but who they receive in the Most Holy Eucharist. In order to explain the pulpit, one must understand the history of pulpits at St. Leo's. The first pulpit at St. Leo's was right next to the south transept. It was at least 20 feet high, and every Sunday, Monsignor Joseph Ray scaled the pulpit to preach to his people from the very top of the church almost to the ceiling. In Monsignor John Hogan's renovation, he moved that pulpit from where it was and created a new pulpit on the south side of the church on the right side of the proscenium arch at the very base. The pulpit that Monsignor Hogan built during that time is very similar to the pulpit that you see before you. But what we wanted to do was combine the elements of both pulpits. So although the shape of this pulpit is like Monsignor Hogan's, what it is decorated with is exactly like Monsignor Wraith's. So it is a combination of the two. And what you have is St. Paul, the great apostle and preacher, in the center with the sword of the Spirit to remind the people that the priest is preaching on behalf of God and his word. And around the exterior of the pulpit are the four gospel writers. We will now take a look at our new communion rail. We have not had a communion rail since the time of Father McKenna. But rather than use Father McKenna's communion rail design, we wanted to go back to something that was more similar to the original. But in this case, we wanted to make it much nicer. The very unique part about this communion rail are the communion rail gates. They came from a basilica that was built in the 1940s on the East Coast. Unfortunately, like many churches during our time, the basilica was decommissioned and the many beautiful artifacts within it were sold. But we were lucky enough to get these beautiful brass communion gates which we had refurbished. We also wanted to put Carrara marble on top so that we could use the communion rail as a real communion rail on Sundays. And as of 2020, at the 8 o'clock Mass, we are presently using the communion rail here at St. Leo's. One of the most interesting parts, but maybe unnoticed parts, about the original St. Leo's were St. Leo's pews and sanctuary wood altar furnishings. They are very unique as they are the old high back pews, and those pews had beautiful engravings of the lion head, which is the symbol not only of Christ, but of St. Leo the Great. We were fortunate enough in this renovation to find pictures of those original pews. And in 2019, found a company out of Nebraska, Radek and Schuler, who was able to replicate those pews for us. Throughout the sanctuary, as well as in the main body of the church, we have a one-to-one -one replica of the original pews and wood altar furnishings that were in the original St. Leo's Church. We decided not to pad or cushion any of these furnishings so that the longevity of the furnishings themselves would be much greater. 
One truly incredible part of this artistic renovation was the window in the north transept of the church. That window, the original one, burned in the 1969 fire and was unsalvageable. During the renovation, we decided that it would be a wonderful gift to the parish to be able to put a more authentic window than the one that they put in in 1969. The 1969 window, although an okay window, did not match the rest of the windows in St. Leo's and was far inferior to the rest of our beautiful windows. One of the most miraculous parts is that we found a company by the name of William Hauser, one of the stained glass artists, actually their number one artist, who was also involved in the restoration of Notre Dame after its burning, did an evaluation of our windows. As we were evaluating the windows, my construction manager, Dean Feist, who was also cleaning the windows at the time, found a tiny little quarter-sized piece of stained glass in one of the windows that said Munich Company of Germany. When we told her that Munich Company of Germany was the one who had done our windows, she boldly said, well, we can definitely find the original templates because I teach the artists from the Munich Company in Germany. She was able to go back to their database, actually probably file cabinets, and find our original templates from 1908. And so, by the grace of God, we were able to do a one-to-one -one replica of the window that burned in the 1969 fire. It was a resurrection of sorts, and so from 2019 on, all those who pass through St. Leo's literally see the original window from 1908. One very unique part about St. Leo's is now our two side shrines. Once, two side altars, we have turned them into devotional areas. I am standing in front of the North Shrine, which is dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, which is a very important devotion at St. Leo's and has been for many years. The people of St. Leo's are able to come, pray before the statue of our Lord and his Sacred Heart, while lighting a devotional candle for their prayer. One very unique part about this North Shrine is that it is also a burial vault. Part of the process of this renovation consisted of exhuming both Monsignor Wraith as well as Monsignor Hogan. After many years after their death, there was still a great love and devotion to these two phenomenal priests two of the founding pastors. I also might add that they laid the foundation of Catholicism in Minot for many, many, many years. And after consultation with Bishop David Kagan, it was decided both at a parish level as well as a diocesan level that they should be exhumed, cremated, and buried in the side shrines. In the North Shrine behind me is the body of Monsignor Joseph Wraith. He had a tremendous and profound devotion to our Lord and Savior, especially our Savior's Sacred Heart. As previously mentioned, as we were discussing the North Shrine, on a diocesan level as well as a parish level, it was agreed upon that we would exhume the bodies of Monsignor Joseph Wraith and Monsignor John Hogan. They had laid the Catholic Foundation for many years in Minot and are still beloved in our community. In this south shrine dedicated to both the Blessed Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, in the bottom vault lies Monsignor John Hogan, who had a tremendous devotion to the Rosary and a tremendous devotion to Our Lady. One very unique part about this particular shrine is the statue of St. Joseph. Again, in the 1969 fire, St. Joseph was actually housed in the altar on the north side where the fire took place. Unfortunately, that statue was completely destroyed. Miraculously, in 2016, when I was on retreat at Sacred Heart Monastery out in the Richerton area, I managed to go on the last day of their retreat through their library. I found a book dedicated to St. Leo's, and in that book was one picture of the original statue of St. Joseph. I asked the sisters, if I might have the book, and they allowed me to take it. Working with Brendan Hample of Finders Keepers, we were able to secure one of the best carvers in Italy, who promised us that he would be able to do a one-to-one -one replica of that particular statue 
of which we had the one picture. To our pleasant surprise and approval, the carver did an amazing job. And when we looked at the picture in reference to the statue that had been mailed, we were so very, very, very pleased. It was in fact a one-to-one -one replica. And in this case, the statue of St. Joseph returned to us after so, so many years. One of the main purposes of this shrine is not only the devotion to the Holy Family, to St. Joseph and Our Lady, and to the Christ Child, but a tradition that had been put on from 2014 onward was that at the marriage of any couple, they would present flowers to the Blessed Virgin Mary after their sacrament of matrimony and their vows, and they would pray a prayer of consecration to Our Lady that she would watch over their marriage for the duration of their lives. That devotion has been widely embraced by all married couples at St. Leo's and is practiced fervently. It is truly a blessing that we are able to do this devotion at St. Leo's and that we were able to secure the original statue of St. Joseph. In the north transept, on the very top of the arch, is Christ enthroned in glory. It also is reminiscent of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. On the left side is St. Sister Faustina, which you will note that both the red and the white rays are radiating also from her heart. On the right side of Christ is St. Michael the Archangel, and on his sword is his name. As of 2020, St. Leo's Catholic Church and its parishioners are deeply devoted to the Divine Mercy devotion, and they also are deeply devoted to St. Michael the Archangel. After masses during certain parts of the year, certain prayers are prayed, and the St. Michael the Archangel prayer is one of those prayers. On the lower part of the imagery, in Latin, is merciful Jesus, I trust in you, which is part of the divine mercy devotion. If you remember the picture that Faustina had commissioned by Jesus himself, he asked that the words, Jesus, I trust in you, be placed at the bottom. And so we adorned the north transept's lower part with those very words. On the top of the arch of the south transept is Our Lady crowned in glory. It is also reminiscent of the Immaculate Heart of Mary as well. On her left side is the Archangel Gabriel holding his lily, and within the lily there is his name inscribed. On the right side, which is very unique, and for the most part a fairly unknown saint, is St. Louis de Montfort, who is a Marian doctor of the church. As of 2020, St. Leo the Great Church now for five years has consecrated itself via St. Louis de Montfort's consecration, which lasts 33 days, to Jesus through Mary. And so to his left is his little book in French called The True Devotion. St. Louis de Montfort was a French priest. On the lower part of the beautiful depiction of art is Todos Tuos on the left. That, in fact, was Pope John Paul II saying, which means we are totally yours. On the other side is Ad Jesum Primarium, which means to Jesus through Mary, which was St. Louis de Montfort's saying. And so here at St. Leo's, we are totally committed to Our Lady. We are totally hers and we go to Jesus through her Immaculate Heart. In the back of St. Leo's Church is our brand new, beautiful baptismal font. Traditionally, in our church, the baptismal font was not located in the back, but originally in the sanctuary in various places over the course of many years and several renovations. Theologically speaking, we have placed it in the back of St. Leo's along with our brand new confessionals because a soul enters the church through baptism and re-enters after committing mortal sin through confession. Practically speaking, one very unique part about this baptismal font is that it is connected to a sequarium in the floor in our basement, meaning that there is a pipe that runs all the way down into a sequarium, which is a cylinder in the dirt underneath the church that allows the holy water after it has been used to disperse into the ground because obviously holy water cannot be dispersed into the sewer. 
Another very unique part about this particular baptismal font is the medallion that it sits on. In the medallion, which is flanked by the scripture passage, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate to damnation is wide and spacious and many take it, but the gate to eternal life is narrow and few find it. What is the gate? The gate really is the church herself, which houses the sacraments of the living God. But the primordial sacrament, the foundation of all of them, is baptism. You cannot be a Christian unless you are baptized. And to that end, thinking of the universal church, what we wanted to do was to show the people of St. Leo's that baptism connects you to the larger church. When Bishop Austin Vetter left for the North American College in 2012 and I became pastor, he gifted me with a very interesting gift. Pieces of the marble floor from St. Peter's Basilica, St. Mary Major Basilica, St. John Lateran Basilica, and St. Paul's Basilica outside the walls. It so happened when he was studying at the North American College in the 90s that he happened to be in those churches while they were doing work on them and bravely and boldly went to the construction workers and asked if he might have a piece of the floor. They in fact gave him pieces of the real marble floor from those four main basilicas. He gifted me those pieces of floor when he left and he said, if you had to re renovate the church, incorporate them someplace according to what you think. In order to show our unity with the larger church, the global church, we took those pieces of floor and placed them into this medallion. And so if you go around the baptismal font, you will see triangles in the floor and above the triangle in gold is labeled the basilica of which that floor is from, symbolizing that once we are baptized, we are not just connected to our parish, we are not just connected to the local community of Catholics, but we belong to a global family of Catholics, and even far beyond that, we belong to the Church Triumphant, all those Catholics who are saved and are awaiting us in heaven. Possibly one of the most amazing theological components of the entire church is the way the sanctuary runs through the people all the way to the back, and the way that the back from the baptismal font runs all the way through the sanctuary up to God the Father. And so if we begin with God the Father, he sends the Spirit, as we have said previously, through the Son, and then onto the altar, in the form, through the Mass, Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. The laity then come to receive the Eucharist for their salvation. But if we look the other way, the laity come from the back of the church through the sacrament of baptism, and then they approach through the medallion, which is the papal keys, in order to receive Christ also for their salvation. The unique theological component of this particular part of the church is that the design of the floor is a different marble than the rest of the design. That particular design runs up the aisle and into the sanctuary. If you were to look down from the choir loft, this design in the floor of this particular marble is in the shape of a key. And within that key are all the sacraments of the church because the sacraments clearly and fully are the key to eternal life because they are the very life of Christ. But housed in the church is the key itself holding the sacraments, which means that the church herself is the key to eternal life. One very interesting part about St. Leo's is the banding that runs around the midsection of the walls of the church. If you have been to Rome, there are several churches that have this type of banding, and so it is very Romanesque. We chose St. Leo the Great's absolutely magnanimous homily from the year 479 that he gave Christmas Eve, which exemplifies who we are in Christ, and most especially why we are at Mass. Most importantly is the inscription on the back wall below the choir loft. Bear in mind who is your head and of whose body you are a member. After receiving the Holy Eucharist on Sunday, Christ is your head and you are truly part of his body. This statement calls us to live our Christian dignity out in the world that flows through the Holy Mass. A very unique part about our altar appointments is our chalice and ciborious set. I traveled to Rome not only to pick out our vestments from Gamarelli's, but I also went to a very, very fine liturgical shop that customizes any type of 
altar appointments that one would desire. The shop was named Getzi's. While I was at Getzi's, we were talking about the various options that we would have for our chalice in Savoria. And we decided that purple should be incorporated because burgundy purple marble was incorporated underneath every other sacrament. To my surprise, they called the quarry in northern Italy, where they actually mine these things. And they had just pulled out a softball-sized piece of amethyst. They were able to cut the chunks of amethyst out of that softball size piece of amethyst, polish them, and put them into this beautiful Saboria chalice set. It's one of a kind, completely custom, and there is nothing else like it. We have been extraordinarily blessed at St. Leo's through this renovation to have acquired one of the most unique and rare monstrances that I have ever seen. And I don't say that lightly, as I have toured many, many parts of the Vatican Museum and even been in parts of the Papal Palace visiting the Holy Father. I had had one of my liturgical art dealers keep his eye out for several years for a monstrance that would be worthy of our newly renovated church, but even more so worthy of Christ and the Blessed Sacrament, creating an even deeper devotion to him in adoration. One of the main purposes of this renovation was to get people closer to Jesus, that Jesus might love them and heal them and lead them in their lives, not just this generation, but for generations to come. One day, this particular liturgical art dealer called and he said, I have a monstrance, but it will be gone by the end of the day, and it is one of the most unique I have ever seen throughout the United States. He said, it was from 1850, German-made, the figurines in the monstrance were of real hand-carved ivory. All of the diamonds on the facade of the monstrance were real, and it was hand-done enamel by a custom artist in 1850 that had done only one monstrance in his life. It is solid silver plated in gold, and by far, it is one of the nicest monstrances I have ever seen. It arrived 2021 on the Feast of Christ the King, which we took as a symbol from God that it was his gift to us for our devotion to his Son in the Blessed Sacrament, as well as our commitment and devotion to adoration at St. Leo's. One of the unique designs in the sacristy is our historical museum case. As we thought about how to encapture, remember, and historically implant the memory of what happened on December 19th, 2020 in our opening mass, we decided that a vestment museum case would be in order. Within this vestment museum case is the original chasuble fiddleback worn by Bishop David Kagan that day. It also houses his mitre above the fiddleback, his pectoral cross, as well as the cincture that he used while vesting. It has the two different thuribles that were used to consecrate both the high altar as well as the altar of sacrifice. On the left are my remarks at the end of mass, housed in a folder, and on the right is Bishop Kagan's homily. There are also two pictures of all of the priests and two bishops that were at this particular mass. Still coming as of 2021 are Bishop David Kagan's coat of arms. Still coming on the back wall will be the dates of each Jubilee year from 2020. That is every 25 years. On that date, the vestment case will be opened. The fiddleback vestment will come out and whoever the bishop is uh, at that time will wear that particular vestment on the Jubilee of the dedication of the church in 2020. There will be several hundred years of dates, and under each of those dates, the coat of arms of each bishop who have celebrated those Jubilee Masses will go, beginning with Bishop David Kagan, December 19th, 2020. Here in the vestibule, we have decorated it not only with chandeliers, but we have memorialized the pastors of St. Leo's. Beginning on the south side and ending on the north, we begin with Monsignor Joseph Wraith, who at a young age in his 20s built 
St. Leo's Catholic Church, the present church as we know it. His protege, associate, and later on successor, Monsignor John Hogan, follows him, who was pastor here his entire priesthood. Following Monsignor Hogan is Father McKenna. Father Francis McKenna was pastor here for 20 years. We then have Father Marv Clemmer, followed by Father Chris Walter. And after Father Chris Walter is when Father Vetter, now Bishop Vetter and myself, arrived in 2008. Bishop Vetter was pastor from 2008 to 2012, and I have been pastor from 2012 to the present, which is now 2021. 